My name is Ben Sharples. I'm a director of photography. And today I want to talk about controlling your image and how to actually get cinematic video in the digital age. Let's jump right into it. One of the apparent issues today is old versus the new. We've all been there, sitting in film school, holding a light beater with a DSLR. Not sure how these two are supposed to work together. One was made in 1965 and the other was made months ago with a menu system bigger than a cookbook. The film workflow of the past was tried and true. Cinematographers would shoot on the film stock of their choice for a variety of reasons. Then they would choose lenses and lighting to accommodate the look they were after. Methods like pushing and pulling were used with the negative. If you aren't familiar with this concept, it's simple. Say you're shooting on Kodak Vision 3 500T and you wanted more grain in your image or maybe more, a more baked in saturation. You would push the film roughly a half stop, which is close to 800 ASA or ISO in digital terms. This means you would expose the film at 800 ISO on your light meter and develop it according to 800 ISO, which would mean more development time, for example. Say you want a more flat look, the methods would be the opposite, thereby pulling. After exposing the negative during production, they would work with the labs to develop preferences for their printer lights to adjust color while creating positive image. This key step in the process is what resulted in why so many films of the past had distinct or nuanced looks to them. Manipulating the printer lights would manipulate, therefore, the color for the positive image, similar to modern color grading. But the great thing about today is you can go and shoot with a film SLR for cheap and learn this process very quickly. And you really see the why behind it. Photography can be a wonderful training ground for those testing these types of image making. Granted, film photography has had quite of a resurgence lately. So the old age argument that film is better than digital tends to become more and more oftenly spoken. The truth is, film or digital are really just choices or tools in the filmmaking arsenal. But what people don't realize is the approach for the specific imager should be dependent on the image itself and nothing else. Essentially, a digital imager or sensor is just a replication device of film. It captures light on the sensor, stores the information, and then it passes it through what engineers call a DSP or a digital signal processor. A DSP will make an array of decisions on the camera's final output. This is important because a manufacturer's DSP process can have a massive effect on the final image. Also explains why we've heard terms such as Canon colors, Sony's shitty colors, Panasonic skin tones, Ari's skin tones, the list goes on. Each manufacturer has a, their own array of decisions behind their DSP, and this affects just the default color on the image coming out of the camera. But professional users know this now, hence why companies now market their color science as one of their leading selling points. Some have even turned a blind eye to it, decide to talk about resolution instead. This isn't new knowledge, however. In fact, some of the greatest DPs working today find ways to bypass these companies' ingrained looks. For example, the DP behind The Last Jedi, Steve Yedlin, held a video study on his website on this very issue. Hi there, my name is Steve Yedlin. I'm a cinematographer and I shot this demo to compare 35mm film and Aries digital camera, the Alexa, each under some selected lighting conditions, samples from the many varied, nuanced, and challenging situations that can come up in motion photography. This demo is different from some other head-to-head -head tests that I know of for a few reasons. Firstly, many head-to-head -head comparisons claim an impartiality that's simply impossible to deliver. This demo does not claim to be impartial. It has a pointed agenda, and I'll be transparent about that agenda and the techniques used to accomplish it. More on that later. So the agenda of this test is to convince you that I can use these image science methods I've accumulated to prepare digitally acquired image data for display in a way that emulates the characteristics that we recognize as filmic. In this demo of Alexa Next to Film, the claim is not that the two images are literally identical in every nuance, obviously they're not as you can see here, but that the film response has been well enough characterized and emulated in the Alexa footage that neither the film nor the Alexa footage looks more filmic than the other, that the substantial part of the look comes from the display preparation and not from the capture format. Yellen's work shows a mastery of multiple camera systems, film and digital. In fact, The Last Jedi was filmed on over three formats, including film and digital. Yellen has condensed a lot of knowledge into a simple way of looking at things, merging the old methods with the new tech, and that has to be the way forward. 
This holistic approach to image making is by no means a new thing, however. All artists must advance their process over time to achieve more, a more singular work. And all mediums have undergone trends and eras of creation where people discover new ways to reach an idea. The truth is you have to develop a method with each project. You should never stop changing your workflows or methods. It bears repeating there are hundreds of permutations that get in the way of this. Color science, imaging, camera system, lensing, trends, aesthetics, the list goes on. Workflow should be made by the artist and only time will tell which suits them best. But there's a principle everyone in image making should abide by. Everything starts in the prep. It's a cliche but it couldn't be any further from the truth. Because the common prep used by cinematographers hasn't changed but the tools have. Now we are able to research and test at a higher grade than ever before. And with the advent of Adobe CC or even slideshow apps, you can now create a vast and well curated lookbook for your project and easily share it with all your crew members. Not to mention, it's never been easier as a consumer to find great films or art to pull from, but where you really gain control is testing. A look or style can be decided before or during the production of a film, but testing the variety of scenarios that may come up can be very helpful. During this testing period, you might find taste in camera and lighting techniques as well. And the capture method of the test is crucial. You're going to want to gather the widest possible information in camera for the given project. With the addition of log and raw video codecs, these formats now make wide control for low and high budget filmmaking possible. Upon storing this exposure data, we are now able to manipulate it in post with color correction and grading. Most commonly, cinematographers will create a LUT or lookup table, which is basically a series of color decisions put into a single file that shows the video file where to put your choices. It's really no different than a photo preset. To me, this is where the power of digital cinematography really comes into fold. We are now able to test, color grade, and decide a look for each given project. Then we can expose the image on set while even monitoring the LUT we created. And by exposing the image with our look monitor on set, it guarantees the visual style is pre preconceived during production. So when a colorist sits down to manipulate the image in post, the colorist can receive the LUT from us and start work with that in mind. It's also possible to manipulate the image before the LUT is even applied by using previous nodes or layers in whichever color software you're using, giving us the full latitude of the image with our vision and color preserved for the final export. This is truly a holistic approach to cinematography. I've personally used this method on my recent projects over the years, and I couldn't be happier with the results. Granted, the LUT is dependent on my testing and my taste and the amount of work I put into my color, so if I and the director approve the LUT or look, then we're off to the races. However, it's key that you create a LUT that can handle the variety of situations the project will throw at it. That's why testing is crucial. For example, you may need two LUTs, one for night exteriors and one for day exteriors. But you will only know this through testing. Digital authorship is really about maintaining your image across the variety of devices. It's key to explore your distribution plan as well, because the common color space online in TV is Rec. 709, which is the broadcast standard. Your work needs to be exported with this in mind. Differences in screen settings or black levels from machine to machine is out of your control. It's your job as a DP to know the range of your imager that you're using. Whichever is your main output space, that should be your focus. For the latest Hollywood films, cinematographers get extensive color grades for each output space, like cinema, TV, online, and even mobile. It's a matter of understanding which color space they are using and when you must convert color spaces for export, which can all be done in DaVinci Resolve, for example. However, all these tools are just a means to get you there to where you and your collaborators are happy with the image. One thing to keep in mind with image making is it's only about what you capture, not always about how you got there. I know this video has leaned heavily into color grading and exposure, but the unchanged elements of cinematography, like composition, lighting, coverage, are even more important than these variables in the equation. But these are the new things that we have to deal with in the digital age, new tools, new processes, things that must be overcome. I'll leave you with this quote by the late great Conrad Hall. Cinematography is infinite in its possibilities, much more so than music or language. Thanks for watching.